Will, you can turn in your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 11, where we will take our final view of our Lord's I am the resurrection and the life expression coupled with an historical event that brings him to the pinnacle of his sign miracles that were performed under the supervision of John's gospel. The resurrection of Lazarus is what we have been looking at over the last three or four weeks. And some would ask, so what is the significance of the raising of Lazarus from the dead? Many are the significance thereof. But I think Sister Martha made it very clear that what our Lord was about to do in verses 41 through 44 required her to make an observation. She thought that she would teach the Lord something about microbiology, microorganisms, and the decay process of the physical body, which tells us she knew some things about it. I don't think we always do. And so the whole subject of death really does not grip us theologically or spiritually until we are confronted with it, until we see a loved one on the brink of dying or until we see a loved one who dies. And if we happen to be in the unfortunate situation of uh, having to deal with the physical corpse of a loved one, we don't really appreciate the nature of death and why it is sort of internally repugnant to us. But 24 to 72 hours after death, the internal organs decompose. Decomposition begins around four minutes after a person dies. Just four minutes after they die, decomposition begins to take place. There are four stages through which the body goes through. Autolysis, bloating, active decay, and skeletonization. They say, knowing this much more acutely today because of technology, that within three to five days after death, the body starts to bloat. And blood containing foam leaks from the mouth and the nose and technically every orifice in the body. It is a consequence of a number of things happening within the body. The first stages of human decomposition is called autolysis or self-digestion. It begins immediately after death. As soon as the blood circulation and respiration stops, the body has no way of getting oxygen or removing waste. Excess carbon dioxide causes an acidic environment causing membranes and cells to rupture. The membranes release enzymes that begin eating the cells from the inside out. Rigor mortis sets in, that is the stiffening of the muscles, and small blisters filled with nutrient-rich fluid begin appearing on the internal organs and the skin's surface. The body will appear to have a sheen due to the ruptured blisters and the skin's top layer will begin to loosen. This is in the first two days. And then because of this, these active acidic uh, elements working in the body and the leaking of the enzymes from the first stages, they begin to produce gases that sulfur and contain compounds that the bacteria releases also causing the skin to discolor. Due to the gases, the human body can double in size in just three days. Insect activity begins to be present. The microorganisms and bacteria produces extremely unpleasant odors called putrefaction. That's the stuff that lets you know it's dying. It's dead. It's suffering a process of decay. These odors are often alerts to let people know that a person has died and can linger long after a body has been removed. The pathogens are also very toxic and deadly. The third stage is that the fluid released through the orifices indicate the beginning of active decay. Organs and muscles and skin become liquefied. 
When all of the body's soft tissue decomposes, hair and bone and cartilage and other byproducts of decay remain. The cadaver loses the most mass during these stages. This is just day one through three. The body is stinking. That's what our sister said, didn't she? By now, Lord, he stinks. Chapter 11, verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I want to call your attention to the fact that Jesus is standing in front of the tomb of Lazarus, and we have been working through this richly, redemptively, and theologically understanding its implications to you and I if you're a believer. And we have come to appreciate, I hope you have, the importance of the man that's standing there. Because the man that's standing in front of Lazarus' tomb is the mediator of the world. He's the mediator of everyone who comes to God by him. The man that's standing in front of that tomb is there to teach you and I that he has conquered death and the grave and every ugly thing that death brings. He has stood in front of it like a conquering king to decree and declare that those who are in Christ have overcome death. But he stood before this tomb at a specific time in a specific way to teach us the nature of his mediation. If you recall, just back at verse 4, he got the news that his friend Lazarus was sick. That's just at verse 4. Now we're at verse 41. And at that time, you know what he did? He began the work of mediation, and that was to submit to his father's will. There are seven stages of our Lord's journey from hearing the news that took place in Bethany from where he was, Beth Arba, about a day's journey, and him standing in front of the tomb. And I want you to understand this journey, because this journey is the journey of Christ and the salvation of his people. The first word is submission. Christ did not immediately begin to be alarmed by the news that his friend Lazarus was sick. In other words, he is not the kind of savior that is re immediately responding to your or my felt needs. Our Lord didn't jump up and go, oh my, my friend Lazarus is sick, what are we going to do? That was not our Lord's first response. His first response, according to verse 4, is, now will my Father be glorified, and I will be glorified in him. What this teaches us is that our mediator has as his highest priority, first and foremost, the will of God. No matter how difficult our circumstance is, the thing that matters when you and I are in trouble is the will of God. And your mediator in mind, if he is one for you, has first and foremost the highest regard for God's purpose in your life because he knows what some of us already know is that all things, I don't care how ugly they are, work together for good to those that love God. So our mediator first and foremost submits to his father. Submission to his father is the evidence that he loves his father. Remember, he was stuck between two loves, wasn't he? How many of you guys are still with me? He was stuck between two loves, love for his father and then love for his people. And this is why we call him the epitome of the commandments. All the commandments are fulfilled in Jesus. He is the end of the law for righteousness because he loved God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength and his neighbor as himself. So before he ran off trying to save somebody, he submitted to God's will. I would submit you do the same thing. And then he moved from submission, now watch this, from submission to love. Because what did he do? Knowing that he had the ability and therefore the permission from his father to do something about it, he told his disciples, all right, let's go. Our friend Lazarus is sick, and I'm going to wake him out of sleep. Remember that? And what we have learned about love is that love is not just a mere sentimentality that does not have a motive, drive, and action behind it. If you love somebody, you're going to do something about it if you can even if it's nothing more than calling on God in their behalf. Don't tell me you love me and don't do anything. Love is always what kind of word? A verb, an action word. It always engages. It moves towards the thing it cares about with regards to its highest well-being. 
So what does our Lord do? He begins to go, doesn't he? Having submitted to his father, now expressing true love for Lazarus, guess what he tells his disciples to do? Come on, let's go. And we learned from that several weeks ago is that the Lord is always working with and through his people to get his job done. This is the thing you guys are about to learn that's so utterly amazing to me as I work through this text. Our Lord did virtually nothing in the redemption of our salvation that did not include his people. Our Lord did virtually nothing in the redemption of our salvation that did not include his people. Our Lord did virtually nothing in the redemption of your salvation and mine that did not include somebody else like you. Our Lord did not do anything within the framework of his incarnation without also employing those who were believers like the person that God wants to do something for in order for it to get done. Can you draw out the syllogism? Can you draw the conclusion? God works through us. So the disciples, because they were truly disciples and not just religious folk who go to church, when Jesus got up and started walking, they got up and started walking. Remember what Thomas said? All right, let's go. So that we can die with Jesus. Because to obey Christ is to die with Christ. To follow Christ and serve others is to die for Christ. To be a true believer is to take up your cross and deny yourself so that it's not always about you first, but others. And so the disciples are walking with Jesus, full well knowing that they're about to go into a storm that's going to end up having Jesus captured. And you know what they said in the depths of their heart? Let's go. Remember what I taught you? Those are affirmations of marriage vows. When a woman says yes to a man, she says, I will go where you go. I will live where you live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And where you are buried, I will be buried. That's a true believer. The rest are not. The rest are not. So the disciples who are going to become the foundation of the New Testament church are about to see something that's absolutely astonishing. They are not ready for it. They don't understand it. But you know how God does? He doesn't wait until we figure it out to let us go. God doesn't let you, he doesn't have to give you a PhD in theology and the different disciplines of biblical teaching before you are ready to serve him. All he wants you to do is put one foot in front of the other, trusting him, and he'll show you as you go. He'll show you as you go. Can I get a witness? He'll show you as you go. You don't need to know everything. All you need to know is him. So not only did he submit, not only did he demonstrate love, not only did he bring his disciples because he would do nothing in terms of our salvation without us, we're about to, about to learn that now, but then he walked in truth. See, in real difficult situations like these, we can get so emotional and so besides ourselves psychologically that we throw truth out the window. We virtually become pagan all over again. Can I get a witness? Sometimes when we're dealing with people that are on the exigencies of dying and being ill and it's almost out of our control, we get stupid. We say things that are unbiblical and unwise. Often we say things that are uncaring. And yet what our Lord did as he made his way towards Mary and Martha was that he retained the truth. First, he said, as soon as Martha came to him, Master, if you had been here, he had not what? Now, he didn't capitulate to that. The first thing he said was, Martha, your brother will rise again. True. The most moronic, the most illogical, the most absurd proposition in the gospel is that we will rise again from the dead. Nobody believes this today. Even the Christian does not walk in the power and the virtue of the resurrection when it comes to their life. We are doing everything to love this life, enjoy this life, wallow in this life, have this life, gratify this life, because we don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. If we did, we'd be out preaching the gospel, suffering for Christ's sake, waiting to die so that we can rise again. Just giving you the application as we go, just in case you don't come back. This is one of the things that people do with biblical teaching is we love to hear and not obey. We love to hear and not obey God's word. And we waste our time when we do that. I admire the disciples, don't you? 
they're walking with Jesus. They're going with them. They are, I'm, I can sense, if I were there, I'd be just like them. I'd be real quiet, wouldn't you? I mean, I'd be real, because they're way out of their pay grade, aren't they? They, they? they haven't taken this class yet. How to raise people from the dead after four days. Because they were with Jesus when he raised others from the dead. That was pretty easy. They had to deal with a few hooping and hollering and, and crying and whining women like we do. <laughs> But our Lord kicked them all out the house and went to the young girl and said, girl, get on up. Go get something to eat. It's all right. I'm here now. And Peter picked up on that because he did the same thing in the book of Acts, right? With Dorcas. He learned how to do it as he went. And then our Lord was doing something else in the gospel of Luke. This is going about his business. Saw a, a widow with her son going to the grave. He stopped the casket, the beer. He said, boy, get up. Boy got right on up. The disciples said, whoa. Oh, master is sharp. But you see, all that's clean. None of that has all of the dirty stuff of four days and self-digestion and, and stinking and the, and the collapsing of the body and the, all of the morbidness of death like we're dealing with now. That stuff just, un, you know, if we can live and die without ever seeing or smelling that, we'd be blessed, wouldn't we? Wouldn't we? And yet the disciples have to go through where we are now. So our Lord, as he began to move upon his mission, submitted, demonstrated love, walked in truth, didn't he? You know what he did next? As soon as the crowd started talking about, had he not been here, couldn't he have raised him from the dead? He got angry. And you guys remember what I taught you about that? A real mediator feels. A real mediator enters in sympathetically understanding the implications of, of such a difficulty as this. Remember the text said, and he was moved deeply. Remember that? And what I taught you was that, that you, you want to throw away all the old movies about Jesus. Throw them all away. Because first of all, he didn't look like that. We'll leave that alone. But secondly, he didn't look like me either, so we'll leave that alone. But thirdly, watch this now, watch this. Just because, you know, I'm always even-handed. He didn't sound like this. Let's go raise Lazarus from the dead. We know that. Uh, our brother is sick and we better raise him from the dead. He was not some monotone, detached, insensitive, sort of android of a being. He was very much a real man with all of the ra ranges of emotion that any real person would have. He, know how, he knew how to laugh. He knew how to weep. He knew how to cry. He knew how to despair. And knew he knew how to be angry. He knew how to be angry, and within him was the anger that I told you was the anger of a lion or a bull or a massive animal that has the ability within its strength to do something, but he restrained himself. He snored it, and all that they're carping, he couldn't do this, he couldn't do that. He was restraining himself because he was not going to act on the whim of their provocation. Is that good or what? Because he was about his father's business. He moves on to Sister Mary and Mary falls to his knees and grabs him. And she says the same thing that Martha says, that all the people says, Lord, if you had been here, my, 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 my brother wouldn't be dead. And at that point, our Lord entered deeper into the sympathy. And according to John chapter 11, verse 35, what did he do? Jesus wept. And I shared with you the expression of that term weeping. It wasn't the kind of weeping that a person does not notice, but rather the kind of weeping that everyone notices. He wept noticeably. He wept noticeably. Now be careful about your weeping because yours is manipulative. Sometimes you weep to get attention for yourself. Be careful of your weeping. I'm just telling you, we, we do that. We... It, it, it never fails me when somebody gets into the middle of a service and it's always about them. Isn't that crazy? How jacked up are we? We're coming to memorialize somebody that the Lord has taken home and then they make it all about them. Aren't we desperately sinful? Aren't we desperately sinful? We'll stand on top of the grave of a person we love and steal glory. That's how desperately sinful we are. When our Lord wept, he did not weep to get attention. He wept 
to confirm the deep pathos that was going on in the, in the lives of those who really loved Lazarus. We have a high priest who was touched with the feelings of our infirmities at the deepest level. In fact, Christ's weeping is a weeping that actually stood in your place because our hearts are too hard to weep like he weeps. We don't go to places like he went because we're not prepared to. We're still too hardened a sinner. This is why our joy is not in how we feel or what we do, but what he did. What a savior to weep for us. What a savior to be sympathetic and empathetic for us. I think it was Jeremiah who said it. Have anyone been smitten with the sorrows and the pains that I have been smitten with, said the Lord. Has anyone suffered like Jesus? The scripture says, men of sorrows, acquainted with griefs, smitten, afflicted, and stricken of God. Was he not? For those of us who look upon him for what he really is. And when I see him, I see myself. Do you? When I look upon Christ, I see who I should have been in my sinful wretchedness, and I see who I am in him because he stood to take my place. You're going to learn something about that here in a moment. Not only did our Lord enter into the sympathy of their suffering in an authentic way, he drew them all in. Watch this now. He, he drew them all in. They all got to come. When Mary was finished hugging his legs, they all followed him and her to the tomb. Everybody came. He wanted them all there. And when he gets to the tomb, this is when Sister Martha thought she would use her little biology degree to help Jesus understand what kind of trouble he's going to get into. Because the only imperative that he gave them was to remove the stone. They had the privilege of following the master from the time that he learned about his friend Lazarus being sick to the time that he's standing now. He's there. He's at center stage. He's there. We're there now, are we not? We're at center stage. If all this is going to make some sense or somebody's going to be utterly embarrassed. Is that not right? Which is going to lead to anger on the part of the mob and the crowd. And you know how fickle people are. They'll love you one day, kill you the next. Mary loved Jesus, Martha loved Jesus, and so Martha is saying to the Lord, now Lord, this brother stinks. By the way, I'm just going to teach you something here just in case you got it last week and wasn't sure. The tomb represents the bondage of sin. The grave represents our captivity by a fallen nature. The wages of sin is what? And when a man or woman does not know God, they are in bondage to sin. We are slaves of sin. We are in a kind of tomb and we are dying. We are spiritually dead, are we not? Until God gives us his grace. And we are isolated from the comfort of others in our own cage. Isn't that what I said? And then there's a stone on top of that cage, on top of that cave, so that you can't get out until God removes the stone. And in mercy, God removes the stone by taking out your stony heart and giving you a heart of flesh so that you can hear his word because a stony heart can never hear God's word. Are you hearing me? A stony heart cannot hear God's word until he removes the stone, places a, a soft heart so he can write on your heart, follow me, I love you, I died for you, I rose again for you. All this is is a lovely song to people. And so he says, take away the stone. And that's when Martha jumps in. By now, he what? which tells us that this was an exclusive cave of Lazarus alone. In other words, there were no other bodies in there. For had there been other bodies in there, even if Lazarus was preserved, we would have smelled those other bodies as soon as that stone was removed. But remember, the stone was removed and there was what? Nothing. That's why Jesus begins to pray. The stone is removed, verse 41. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. Now the stone is removed. The cave is wide open, isn't it? Wouldn't there be a, a rushing stench coming out? If there were multiple bodies in there rotting? Oh yeah, we do all we can to cover the body with herbs and spices and all that because we know. But you cannot stop decomposition. I don't care what kind of perfume you use. Eventually, it's going to show up. Now, had there been other bodies in that cave, 
that Christ did not raise from the dead, wouldn't the stench have come out? Wouldn't there have been confusion as well as to what about what's going on here? You got some people dead, some people stinking, and you're about to call Lazarus out of it. The people don't say anything because there was nothing going on because the only person that was in that cave was Lazarus. Just like the only person was in that borrowed tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had purchased was Jesus. Are y'all hearing me? And that's because as I taught you last week, Lazarus loved Christ and Christ loved Lazarus and Lazarus is about to be rewarded with the life of Christ even before Christ dies. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so we are standing in front of this tomb with the stone removed and our Lord begins to lift his eyes to heaven and say, Father, I what? Thank you. That's the next stage. We've gone from submission to love to truth to anger to weeping. Watch this now to rejoicing. I know that people don't get it and you may not get it either, but I do. The Lord Jesus is rejoicing because his father has heard his prayer. The Lord Jesus is rejoicing because daddy has once and again answered his prayer. The Lord Jesus re is rejoicing not because he didn't know whether or not once the stone was removed that the stench would come out. But he knew that the stone being removed was God's grace to the people. And God affirmed that grace to the people by nothing happening. Hence, we are ready for the next step, are we not? Before we go there, I want you to think about why Jesus is praising God. Do you see the idea, the term there in the last clause? After he says, Father, Father, Pater, I thank you. Do you see that? Right. There are two words in the Greek for being thankful. And they're both worthy of, of, of understanding. The first one has to do with the term confessing or acknowledging or declaring who God is in terms of admitting all that you know. Ex homologia is the term that we use when we say we will confess our sins to God and he is just and faithful to forgive us. Homo logos means to agree with God. It's the term that was used in the days of John the Baptist when they were coming to the River Jordan to be baptized, confessing, confessing, confessing their sins. And Jesus frequently raised his hands in confession of his father. The word is used in Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, when Jesus says, Father, I thank you that you have hid these things from the wise and prudent and you've made them known to babes. Jesus frequently confessed his father publicly and openly as the Psalms said he would. I will declare your name. I will give thanks and praise to you in the midst of the great congregation. You see, our Lord was rather charismatic, wasn't he? See, some of you wouldn't dare lift your hands. Some of you wouldn't dare raise your eyes, Father! But the Son of the living God, the only begotten Son of the living God, had access to the Father, and he let the world know it. See, he's celebrating what he is about to bring to pass even before it happens. And I want you to see what he says and the theological import behind it. Because what he's saying is not for himself or his father, but the people that are there. Here's what he says. Father, I thank you. The word is not homologeo or ex homologeo. It's the word eucharistia from which we get the term eucharist which those of us who are believers today are going to partake in, the Eucharist. The word "uo" chariso simply means full of grace. When we go eulogy, when we do a eulogy, we speak good words, kind words, full of favorable words. Is that true? Uo Christo or uo Christo simply means that we are full of gratitude for God's mercy in our life. It's the same word that's used in Luke 22, where when Jesus, before he breaks the bread to give it to his disciples, he says, Father, I thank you. And then he tells the disciples, this is the reason why the bread is broken. It is a Eucharist offering. It's where you acknowledge that all you have is a consequence of God's grace. That's what Jesus is doing here. He is expressing gratitude for the grace of God that's been in his life since the time he came into this world. By the way, that would do you good if you start practicing that too. 
If you start practicing thanking God for all that you have and all that you are and all that you could be over against all that you could have been in terms of a mess, God might actually advance you somewhere. See, because a lot of times we lose the blessings that are ours because we don't acknowledge the blessing that we have. And our Lord did. Our Lord did. So, so come on now, stay with me now. Don't let this be pedantic. Get it now, because the Lord Jesus is not only a manifestation of the invisible God bodily, but he is the prototype of every true believer. If you are a child of God, you're a son of God too. You have every right to thank God for all of the goodness in your life. God's been better to you than you deserve. Way better to you than you deserve. Way better to, to you than you deserve. And you and I, hey, listen, we've got all kind of struggles, don't we? But none that should shut my mouth to praising God for all that he's done for me. No trial should shut my mouth for all that God has done for me. Getting ready to show you that beautiful truth as we work it through. So under our first point, quickly, let me move through this. The confidence of his communion with his father is the reason he's raising his hands. He's doing his father's will. Do you know what the scripture says? If any man will do God's will, he'll know of the doctrine, whether it be God, of God or not. Jesus said in John chapter 8, 29, listen, I know my father loves me because I always do those things that please him. Now, only Jesus could talk like that. His confidence lied in that he had always walked impeccably obedient to his father. So anything he asked his father, his father would what? Do it. Now watch this. Didn't the blind man affirm the same thing in John chapter 9, 31? Remember when the rulers came to him and said, who healed you? He said, Jesus. They said, Jesus is a sinner. He said, now stop right there. You call him Jesus a sinner. Now we all know. We all know that God does not hear sinners. Isn't that what verse 31 of chapter 9 says? We all know that God doesn't hear sinners. Watch this now. But the one that does the will of God, him God hears. Now we know one who did the will of God. What is his name? Jesus. And so even the blind man was able to affirm that there is no way that a person born blind could be healed other than God doing it. I want to show you one last text then in relationship to why we don't want to miss this overture in verse 41. And that is... The spirit of prophecy in Psalm 68, verse 18. Pull that out. Show you the truth. You heard this taught by uh, Stephen a few weeks ago, Psalm 68, 18. And it's a verse that you want to learn and you want to grapple with. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not what? If I regard iniquity, Psalm 66, 18, I'm sorry. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, I believe that with all that's in me. Do you? And I know sometimes God doesn't answer my prayer because my prayers are jacked up. Ask James chapter 4 verses 1 through 3. Remember, we have not because we ask not. And if we do ask, we don't receive because we've asked with a funky motive. Why should God just give me what I want? If he loves me, he won't. If God loves me, he won't give me everything I want. Do I actually know what's best for me? No. No. And a good parent has learned to use the no card all the days of raising their kid. If you want to get your kids up straight, say no. If you want your kids to be lopsided, say yes to everything. They'll go astray as soon as they can. No's are designed to head you in, to help you discern your own inclinations for things that are not good for you. And here's the thing that kids will know. They'll know when you go to saying yes to them, it's time. Is that true? They'll know that when you go to saying yes to them, they know that you've got it. That they'll know that you know that they've got it. That they can trust you with that thing that they're asking for now. Piece of advice for, for children today. Get to a place where your parents say yes because they know they can trust you. Could our father trust his son? The text says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not what? Verse 19, though, however, goes on to say, but verily God hath what? He hath what? Attended to the voice of my cry. Can these words be applied to Jesus? I want you to go back to our text and show you something. Show you what Jesus said, and I want you to get this. This is the joy of the heart of our Lord Jesus. He said in verse 42, after having said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. That's what we call a past tense phraseology. Father, I thank you that you have heard me. What that means is, Every time Christ remembers praying to his father, his father answered his prayers. 
When he goes, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Past tense. That means wherever Christ prayed, and we don't know all of Christ's prayers, do we? But we know he often went into the mountains and prayed, don't we? We know he often prayed before he did ministry, don't we? We know that Christ did not do ministry presumptuously in his own strength. Don't we know that? And here's what we know. Watch this now. Every miracle, every healing, every breakthrough, every accomplishment of the work of Christ was a consequence of his father saying yes to him. Everything that Christ did in the whole of his gospel ministry was a consequence of the father saying yes to him. Would you agree with that? Because the son would never do anything without the father's approval. Well, I want to show you a glorious truth here. Not just that Christ was able to enjoy looking back and seeing how every time he had an assignment, his father was working with him to do the work. As he says, I work and my father works, right? So that they were always in constant unity with everything that they did. This is how the father is glorified in the son. Never ever separate the son from the father because it's the purpose of the son to glorify the father. But this is amazing. He says over in verse 42, and I know that you hear me what? Now stop back at verse 42 for a second. Your Bible doesn't say, and I know. It says, and I knew. Do you see it? Now, if you've got a good translation, that's what it should say. Now, that's weird English grammar. Because he's saying, and I knew you hear me always as if he knew something beforehand. And he did. Because what he's really saying can be broken down in our English syntax this way. And I have known. And I have known. I have always known. It's in what we call a past perfect tense. Literally, pluperfect. What does that mean? It was already accomplished before it was expressed. What does that mean, Pastor? It means that before Christ came into the world, he knew his father had already agreed with him. Before he even assumed a human nature, his daddy was saying yes to everything that he would do. Christ never once worried about whether the father would forbid him doing anything. Why? Because before the foundation of the world, the son said yes to his father to be the mediator and vouchsafe of his people who would in this world fall into sin and ruin so that from the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God slain. What does that mean? Every healing, every miracle, every work of grace, every redemptive act, every salvific overture on the part of God, from the fall of Adam to Lazarus right now, was a consequence of Christ having already been the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If you understand what I'm saying, raise your hand. Every healing, every miracle, every sign, every wonder, every recovery of lost sinners. Isn't that amazing? Adam and Eve raised their fist against God, sin like I don't know what, with the greatest of clarity, clarity that you and I don't have. And they ran from God. And God should have justly let them go to hell. But because Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, God counterintuitively hunted them down, corrected them, clothed him in his righteousness, having already shedded the blood of a lamb as their substitute. And this has happened throughout redemptive history from the beginning of time up to this very day. You and I are always operating on the grace of God given to Christ before the world began. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you see it? Hallelujah. Watch this. So don't even separate miracles or wonders or signs from the atonement. It's all centered in the atonement. By the way, that's the reason why we sung the hymns we did this morning, because many of us are historically and, and cognitively aware that we are the blessed fruit of the Reformation, and we uh, uh, celebrated that earlier this week on the 31st of October. You don't know it, but you are free religiously, because of the suffering of men and women who believe the gospel 
rooted in the word of God and salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone apart from works. You don't know it, but you are the children and byproduct of those who are willing to stand over against false doctrine and heresy. So you're free today by their sufferings. You're free today to worship God according to the Bible alone because of what they went through. Alone. Alone. And here the mediator is standing there. I have always known that you have heard me because of the people standing by. I said it in order that they might what? So they're getting ready to see something here. They're getting ready to see something here. Watch this now. Let's just go to work. Point number two. Point number two. The call of life and the soul of the redeemed. We call this the call of life. So after our Lord says what he says in verse 42... We read verse 43. And when he had thus spoken, he what? And when he had thus spoken, he what? Ah, there it is again. Stop. I want you to get this next inclusio of emotion on the part of Christ. He didn't whimper. He didn't whisper. He cried. That's why I like the way Angelo said it. I said, Angelo can get him a, a, a job as an actor now. He said, Lazarus. Come forth! <laughs> because we are called to exegetical exposition, and therefore we labor in the scriptures with the kind of diligence that calls for us to analyze text very carefully, we, by the grace of God, can get behind the English language and see the larger implication of words, as I often do with you, to bring them out. Otherwise, when you read your Bible, your Bible is kind of just a bland thing you read without expository help. And you will quickly miss that Jesus cried. He cried! For Lazarus, his friend. Do you see it? He cried. Now, what this would say to me is that this is a continuation of the weeping that started back at verse 35. That as my mediator, he's weeping while he's working. He's weeping while he's working. He's not detached. He's weeping while he's working because his work is in consequence of my condition. Why should he stop weeping even though he's rejoicing? until he has brought me to himself. He's weeping while he's rejoicing. By the way, can we do that? Can we weep and rejoice at the same time? Can we laugh and cry at the same time? Can we be angry and happy at the same time? Yes, we can, and often we do. Our Lord is weeping because of his friend Lazarus, whom he dearly loves, because the work that God has called Christ to do in Lazarus' life is not done yet. It's not enough to remove the stone. It's not done until his father is glorified in him and in Lazarus. He cries out. He cries out. Here it is. He cries with a loud voice. There it is for those of you folks who don't like loud people. Ha! Your savior was loud. Your pastor is loud. And the spirit of God in Christ didn't have to be that way. But on the other hand, he did. Because you see, salvation is the totality of the saving of everything that you are. See, we, we intellectualize this so often. But every tear is precious to God. How many of y'all believe that? The Bible says plainly that he has a bottle. He has a bottle where he stores up the tears of his people. We already learned that Jesus was representing his father as he did in Exodus 2 and 3 in hearing the groans, the groans, and the cries of his people, right? He holds our tears in his bottle. Isn't that comforting? But the information is this, that Jesus was a real man. And he was a fuller man than we could ever be. Because in the fullness of his humanity... What was absent was selfishness and pride that exists within us. As we learned last week, you and I can fall so awfully short of empathizing with the fruit of our own womb. Tell the truth. You and I can fall awfully short of sympathizing with the fruit of our own womb. We can be so arrogantly selfish, so narcissistically bent on ourselves that we can't even cry when a loved one dies. Because we don't understand at all 
what it is that they're suffering and we don't care. But when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep, he meant everything that was in him. Every emotion, every thought, every volition, every intentionality, every aspect of his total humanity was given over to represent us and to enter into our stead and in our place in order that God would have an adequate son by which he can be pleased in. I'm so glad that Christ cries for me. I'm glad that he's burdened for me. I'm glad that he cares for me. He cares for me because I don't even care about myself. I don't care about myself. I'm just all about me. You too. All of, you know, the world revolves around. The, we wouldn't even let the sun shine if it was up to us. I ain't happy today. I don't want nobody else to be happy. Sun, stay down. Right? Right? We, we, no, sun, stay down. Cloud cover the moon. I'm not happy. I want nobody else happy. What I'm... God help you get it. The healthiest thing you can do is, is stop highly esteeming yourself and start highly esteeming Jesus. Stop highly esteeming yourself because you're fooling yourself. What you see in the mirror is not the most beautiful person of all. <laughs> Just not. Tell the truth. Use the mirror of the word of God and say, Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a mess. And know that Christ paid for that too. See, you can, you can tell the truth with God. You can be all ugly. You can be nasty. You can be cantankerous. You can be mean. You can be bent out of shape. You can be all of the, 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 the demeritous characteristics of a human being. And Christ has paid for that if you're his. Is that true? You can, you can just be authentic about how messed up you are, how jacked up you are, how twisted you think. I don't think right. I don't act right. I can't even trust myself. Thank you, Lord, that you paid for that too. See, some of you are going to have to learn how grace works and start cashing in on the grace so that you can walk in the liberty wherewith Christ sets us free. By the way, we're about to get there. Remember I told you we don't know a whole lot about our friend Lazarus, do we? We don't know a whole lot about it. But I said, I think the Lord loved him because he had two sisters. One named Martha and another named Mary. That's just enough for the Lord to love him. Don't y'all think? And we don't have a whole lot to, to learn about Lazarus in that regard. But what God is about to do is teach us by inference that Lazarus loved Jesus. And Jesus loved Lazarus. And for all intents and purposes for the last four studies, here's what I've been saying. All you need to know is whether or not that person is loved of Christ for you to say, Father, him whom you love needs your help. Are you with me so far? Say with me. Say, I don't need to know everything about you. All I need to know is if you are a child of God. If you're a child of God, I know you love God. And I know God loves you. And all I have to say is, Father... Her whom you love, him whom you love, they need you right now. Because that's what our mediator does in our behalf. Am I making some sense? All right, the work is about to be done, and there's some lessons to be learned. The call of life and the soul of the redeemed. Jesus is calling Lazarus, isn't he? Remember the text says, he cried with a loud voice. Who come forth? Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. Now, there are three things for you to know. You and I will experience three calls in our life. First, every one of you that are here, you have been called to be here because you have been called to life. Life is not an accident. You are here by design, by providence, and by God's purpose. Every soul that enters into the world enters in by calling. Jeremiah said, you called me from my mother's womb. Paul said, you called me by your grace from my mother's womb. What does that mean? Every child that comes into existence is called into existence. If you were not called, you would not be culpable for your life and have to stand before God on the last day. 
If you were not called, you would not be culpable for how you act and standing before God on the last day. But because you are going to stand before God, because we all shall stand before God, you know you are called. Now, there's another call that God does in his auspicious nature, and I trust everyone in this room has heard that call. It is called the gospel call. It's when you're going about your merry way as a human being, and all of a sudden God starts messing with you. All of a sudden, God starts getting in your business. All of a sudden, God starts interrupting your plans and your schemes. All of a sudden, God starts getting in your head, starts cutting the lights on. All of a sudden, God starts interrupting your schemes and agendas by putting stumbling blocks there and allowing you to stumble over into the difficulty of life. All of a sudden, your life is full of trouble. And now, all of a sudden, you are aware that there is a power working mysteriously in your life that's impeding your progress, calling your attention to him. And then, all of a sudden, in God's good mercy, guess what? At the right time, he sends a gospel preacher. He sends a gospel preacher. He sends a preacher of the gospel. He puts you in the right place at the right time to hear the message of redemption. That's John 5, 24. The hour is coming. When all shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. And there was a day when the Spirit of God, working through the preaching of the gospel, got a hold of your heart and started dealing with you in terms of your soul. Am I telling the truth? One day not, the next day yes. One day not, the next day yes. It all changed in a nanosecond, didn't it? Life's on. God's real. I'm in trouble. I need help. Lord, have mercy. Lord have mercy. And then he began to show you the glories, the glories of his son Jesus Christ. And I don't know if it was like this for you, but for me, it was utterly amazing that God would tell me that he had a substitute for my soul, a redeemer for my sin, a ransom for my life. This is amazing. Point number two then, the call from death to life is what? The fact of salvation. I'm not going to preach that. That's what we preach all the time. The call from death to life is the fact of salvation. In the same way Lazarus is being called out of the tomb, I was called out of the grave of my sin. In the same way that Lazarus is going to be qualified to come up out of the deep darkness of death, so I was brought up out of spiritual death. You who were dead in trespasses and sins, God hath quickened. By grace are you saved. By grace are you saved. The Spirit of God hunted down a hell-bound soul, dead in trespasses and sins, and spoke peace to your soul, mercy to your soul, grace to your soul, life to your soul. And you know what he said to you? Come forth! And you did. Yeah. And today, you are another Lazarus. And it was because of point number C. A ransom was paid to deliver your soul. Isn't that amazing? I'm just, I'm just going to read through the verses. They really do require exposition. I'm just going to read through them. This is what we, I'm going to be teaching next Friday at our conference in, uh, in uh, Valley Bible Church in Hercules on the sufficiency of Scripture, presenting a sufficient Savior. The sufficiency of Scripture, presenting a sufficient Savior. And the topic is around this truth. That the only thing that men and women need to hear to be saved securely for all eternity is the word of God. The only thing that men and women need to hear to be saved securely for all eternity is the word of God. The sufficiency of biblical proclamation sets you up to know God for all eternity. And this is eternal life that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Therefore, we are not ashamed to preach the gospel because it is the what? Power of God. Power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. For the just shall live by what? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For without faith, it's impossible to believe God. 
or please him. Is that right? Or please him. And this is the beauty of this glorious, glorious doctrine of faith. Resident in the soul of people who... Y'all know something about what I'm talking about? Do y'all know something about... Raise your hand if you know something about... We're going to burn some more calories. I know what it's like to know God in the power of his mercy and grace. I know what it's like to believe God when I didn't believe him before. My soul says yes to Jesus. It says yes to Jesus. This is how you know you're one of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice. And they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Isn't that true? You are my disciples indeed. If you continue in my truth, and you shall know it if you continue in my word. And it will continue to what? Liberate you. Liberate you. Liberate you. Job chapter 33 verse 22 through 24. Let's read it together, not you audibly. I'll just read it. I want you to pay attention to it with me. Job is describing how a person is saved. In fact, let's do Job chapter 33, verse 20. They'll get there in a while. Let me go back there too. Y'all got your Bibles? Now we have this technology by which you can see the scripture up on the screen, but I would suggest that you bring your Bibles from time to time because just in case the screen goes dead. Isn't that right? Because when you set your eyes on the Bible, then you know you're setting your eyes on the veritable word of God. Look at what it says in Job chapter 33, verse 19. He is chastened also with pain upon his bed. What is Job describing? Sickness. And the multitude of his bones with strong pain, so that his life abhorreth bread and his soul dainty meat. His flesh is consumed away that it cannot be seen, and his bones that were not seen stick out. Is that uh, Lazarus' condition? Yes, it was. Yea, his soul draws near unto the grave and his life unto the destroyers. If there be a messenger with him, who is this messenger? Jesus Christ. See, as you're sinking down into the grave, as you're getting older, as you're getting sick, as you're waning weak, as you're about to die, you know what you need? A messenger. You need an interpreter. You need someone that can stand between you and what you're going through. Watch this, watch this, and say, this sickness is not unto death. That's what you need. You need somebody to mediate for you. Isn't that what Jesus did for Lazarus? Hey, he's not going to die. Hallelujah. What a mediator, especially when you're sinking. Listen to it. He says in verse 23, if there be a messenger with him, an interpreter, one among a thousand, to show man his uprightness. Now, what is God's righteousness? Christ. What do men need to see? Christ. You and I, when we're seeking deep in sin, need one thing as our remedy, a revelation of the righteousness of God in Jesus. When you are sinking down, ask God to reveal Christ to you because he is the righteous one. And he is the only one that can make you righteous, especially in time of need. This gives us some insights, ladies and gentlemen, as to how it was that Lazarus was going down. Don't you, don't you think about that? What was happening with Lazarus as he was getting sick? I talked about this with our prayer team. Stay with me. See, again, because we're so careless. Lazarus is sick. And when you're sick, you're isolated. Oh, you may have all sorts of people around you, but you're in a bubble by yourself. How merciful is God to grant you the comfort of knowing that you have a mediator when you're going down? How merciful is God to recall the scriptures to your mind when you're going down? How merciful is God to send comfort to your soul by the Spirit of God when you're going down? How merciful is God to cause you to remember the scriptures while you're going down? I quote them all the time. Remember the word unto your servant upon which you have caused me to hope. This is my comfort in all my affliction because your word quickens me. How good it is to know God's word when you're going down. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Oh, grant me your law graciously, oh God. Quicken me according to your word. And I can tell you, that's what Lazarus was doing 
while he was going down. And the Lord was actually reciprocating with him like this. Look at it. Verse 24. Then God is gracious unto him, is he? And said to him, what? Deliver him from going down to the pit. I have found a ransom. That's where we are. Is that where we are? Is that where we are in our text? That's, so everybody thought Lazarus was done. And Lazarus was the object of an extraordinary act of grace. Wasn't he? Go back to our text. Let me show it to you. I'm done here. I'm done here. You and I are standing in the midst of the most important aspect of your salvation and mine. God dealing with your greatest enemy. You and I are at the fulcrum of the work of Christ. At that place where you and I want to be able to affirm God in terms of being a child of God. If I never see you again, never see you again, get this. You and I do not want to die without a messenger. You don't want to die without an interpreter. You don't want to die without a mediator. You don't want to die without a ransom. Do you hear me? You don't want to die without your sins being paid for. You know what a ransom is? A ransom is the price that must be paid by the one demanding the price for your soul. And can you imagine that you have been made by design to be worth the death of God's Son? Write it down. This is, this is what I mean by people not really knowing the gospel. Are we at the heart of the gospel? This is what I mean by people not knowing the gospel. Oh, I know the gospel. No, you don't. No, you don't. The gospel is the most tremendous, the most exquisite, the most profound, glorious message in the universe. It is at the heart of the nature of God. And it is to be studied over and over again, like layers on an onion, peeled back every glory, every glory, every glory of the person and work of Christ should be the whole of your interest until you see him face to face. This thing about getting bored with the gospel simply means that you don't know the gospel. It just means you don't know it. You don't know it when you don't understand that God's love for you is such that the price that he demanded for himself of you was his son. Now, let's do some numbers right quick. Are you individually even remotely equal to anything that has to do with any aspect of God's only begotten son? Could you even begin to measure up to the fullness of him as a man, let alone him as God? Why would God pay that much for you? Should shut your mouth. It should lay you in the dust. It, it should cause you to go, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. For you have redeemed me by the blood of your only darling son. And why he would pay that price? For you. For if you were the only one to have sinned in this world, he still would have paid that price. Do you know why? He paid for more than just your being. He paid for your eternity. He paid for your eternity. He paid for not only your humanity and your fall into sin. He paid for your going to hell. He paid for the place you haven't gone to yet. He paid for an eternity in hell for you. And then not only that, he purchased what you lost in Adam, which was eternal life. He had to get that back. God bought the whole thing for you. 
What wondrous love is this, O my soul? What wondrous love is this, O my soul? That Christ would die for a wretch like me. Do you see it? Is this glorious? Does it shut your mouth? Does it cause you to wonder? Does it humble you with joy? All of us in this room together are not even a smidget close to measuring up to Christ. And yet he would die for every single one of us. This is why it's anathema not to love him. This is why it's anathema not to love him. This is why the whole of salvation is about love as we learned last night. This is why God is love. Did you guys get this? This is why God is love. This is why you don't play down salvation. You don't play down redemption. You don't play down the cross. You don't play down God's glory in Christ for your soul. You beg him to give you the spirit of glory so that you can worship him rightly for all that he has done for you. You beg him for it. That's why David wrote so many songs. See, David was a man after God's own heart, wasn't he? That's why that brother could sing about God. He knew how bad he was, but how good God was. He knew how wretched he was, but how glorious God was. How glorious, glorious, glorious God was. Listen to it now. Verse 44. And he that was dead, what? Came forth. He that was dead came forth. Now that's oxymoronic. So how do you come forth if you're dead? Unless God gives you life. And when God gives you life, don't you admit that God gave it to you, that you didn't help him? That you didn't agree with God? You didn't make a decision for Jesus. He made a decision for you. And came and got your soul and brought you out. And you know now that every step that you are making is by the power of God's grace. Every step that you're making, you say, unto God be all the glory for every step. Because once I was dead, now I'm alive. Once I was blind, now I can see. God has shown me mercy and brought me back from the dead. See, only a few people know what I'm talking about. For the rest of us, this is a mystery. And yet the burden of my heart is not so much the doctrine of soteriology relative to your salvation. But I am afraid that our hearts are so hard. That you'll wait till you get to where Lazarus was. And you'll hear no one say, take away the stone. Our final point then, the privilege of co-laboring with Christ. This humbles me and it's worthy of its own message. But I'm going to let it, I'm going to uh, 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 unfold it in all of its fundamentals here without developing it because of our time's sake, because we want to partake of the table. The privilege of co-laboring with Christ. Lazarus would have never been able to come forth had the people not done what Christ said. Is that true? Verse 41, part eight, then take away the stone. They took the stone away. Christ declares Lazarus come forth, verse 44, and he that was dead did what? Came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, which means he was really dead which means he was really prepared, which means there were people who had buried him, cared about him, loved him, and put him in the grave, right? Which means they had all closed on Lazarus. They had all closed on Lazarus. Remember, they were in closure mode. Lazarus was the object of people who did not believe in the resurrection. They just shut Lazarus down. And here comes Lazarus. He happy. Lazarus is happy. Wouldn't you be happy too? First of all, you lay it flat down and then the Spirit of God lifts you up on your feet and you hear Christ say, come, I'm coming, I don't care how, I'm coming, bow, I'm coming. Right. Because when life is implanted in the soul anew, you're not ashamed of the gospel. Yeah, I got issues, but I'm alive. I'm bound, but I'm alive. I'm tied down, but I'm alive. I got grave clothes, but I'm alive. I am alive. I'm God's raggedy living creature. That's right. That's right. Why are you hopping? Because I'm saved. I'm hopping because I'm saved.
And then here's what our Lord does that he teaches me. I don't know if he teaches you this. I know this from experience. And I said it at the beginning of the message. He doesn't do anything with which he glorifies his Father except through his people. Christ couldn't even be incarnate except his people obeyed the gospel from the days of Adam to Sister Mary that we are going to honor as we deal with Advent week. If there weren't believers from the days of Adam up to Mary, Jesus would have never had a human nature. God asked Joseph and Mary to cooperate with him in the process of the incarnation. Are y'all with me? That's how God always works. He never ever just glorifies himself apart from you except on special occasions. Do you recall the first miracle that Jesus did? Turning the water to wine. And do you remember what he said? Fill the pots. He had his boys fill the pots with water. Do you remember the other magnanimous miracle that he did? The people are hungry on the hillsides. And there's only a small little loaf of bread and fish that a young boy has. And remember what he tells his disciples? Sit them all down. Put them in groups. And he blessed the bread and he gave it to who? The disciples. Which is the same as giving us the gospel to give to the world. And what does God do with that bread? He multiplies it. He multiplies it. He multiplies it. And then we give it back to him. And it's more afterwards than it was when we gave it to him. Because we cannot exhaust God's grace. But the point is, God works through his people. So you can sit here all you want to. You can sit here all you want to and celebrate what God does. And actually be a person who does nothing for the kingdom of God. Do you hear me? Oh, there's so much to say. Just look at the three sub points. He was called to life by Christ again. He was committed to the care of the body of Christ, right? Is that true? And then finally it says, it is a call to what? Life and what? Yes, it is. You do the gospel right. And, and men and women come to know God in the truth. And out of a real love and gratefulness for God's mercy in their life, they live for God. And the ministry of the local church is to help liberate you from error and falsehood and ignorance. The goal of the church is to teach you the word of God so that you can walk in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. That's the goal of the local church. And every believer has the responsibility and privilege, I dare say, to be able to help some damaged soul come to know the power of God's grace in your own private assignment. You may be called by God to just take the stone away. That's all you're doing. You're going to take the stone away by telling that man or that woman they need God. And then God will send somebody else alone to help strip them of the grave clothes when he saves them by his grace. Because you see, it's not about you. But God works through you. Am I making some sense? It's not about you, but God works through you. And how much joy is there to strip back those cloths of death, those garments of the grave, and help men and women loosen on up so that they can walk free in Christ and serve Christ in the freedom wherewith Christ has set them free. Amen. 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 We're going to have the offering at this time.